That's what we can give out to build his kingdom, to compel them to come into the kingdom, go into the highways and byways, compel them to come in. What's going to compel them? Telling them that they're lousy sinners and that they're going to go to hell? Well, that will scare some people enough to come into the kingdom. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. That's what the Bible says, right? So it's through that goodness and loving kindness that people get healed too. Best thing for trauma ever. God promises in Joel 2.28 to pour out his spirit on all humanity. Welcome to Global Outpouring. We contend for that promise outpouring. We equip for that outpouring so that we may engage in that very outpouring. I'm Philip Buss. And I'm Sharon Buss. Welcome to the podcast today. We're so glad to welcome a dear friend of many years, Valerie Melroy, who is going to be one of our speakers at our upcoming convention 2024, June 11th through 14th. And we're going to be talking today about the outpouring of the Father's love. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so glad that you're with us. Before we get started with this wonderful discussion that we're going to have with Valerie Melroy, we want to encourage you, if you haven't already done so, that you would go to our website, globaloutpouring.net, and give us some feedback of this podcast or any podcast that you have heard, and make sure that you're on our mailing list, our email list. We want to stay in touch with you and and let you know how important you are to us because we are doing this for you. We're doing this for you, listener. Yes, I mean you. Please, please know that you are important to our Father, and that's why he is having us have this podcast today because you are important and we we want to establish a relationship with you. So please make sure that you're on our email list. And if you want to respond and tell us what's going on in your heart or something that you want us to do a podcast on or a prayer request, just let us know how we can help you. So Valerie Melroy, thank you so much for joining us today. We really, really appreciate you being with us. Thank you. It's so good to be here, Philip and Sharon. We appreciate this time and love you so much. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, we've known each other a good many years. Uh, (laughs) I don't necessarily want to say how many, but a good many. And you were on our staff for quite a while, a long, long time ago. And we knew your mother. She was a part of our ministry and your sister also. And just tell us a little bit about your upbringing and your history and how you came to the Lord and et cetera. Sure. I'd love to share that. I'm so grateful and I honor both of my parents, my mom and my dad. And it was my mother that had the ferocious hunger for more. We grew up in a United Church of Christ church. And when the pastor's wife taught me in Sunday school that the story about Noah and Jonah and all these things weren't really true. They were just good stories in the Bible. (gasps) My mother decided that this is not a church that maybe we should be in. And she and my father talked to the pastor. He was not willing to change their stance. And so Mm. we started looking for somewhere else to go and it ended up in an Assembly of God church. Well, (laughs) (laughs) amen. So my mother and five of her friends, many of whom, you know, who Penny Drexel, who lived down there, Sandy Thomas, who also traveled with Sister Gwen and so forth. Kitty Christie, who just passed away, by the way. Oh, I hadn't heard that. Yeah. But Randy Smith's mother-in-law and so forth got together every Tuesday and prayed for six or more hours in the 60s and 70s. And just searched for God and just pressed in and said, Lord, we see what it says in Acts. We want to do this. We know there's more of you than we even know or have experienced. We want more. They Mm. kept pushing in. They went down to John Poole's church in Philadelphia, which is back then a big deal. Miracles every Tuesday night or whenever they went. And I went my first time down there. A lady who never played the piano before got up and played this melodious music and said it was came from heaven. <laughs> and oh, it sure did sound amazing. like it. I mean, it, there were signs and wonders and miracles there. And so I started about 10 or 11, really seeking the Lord deeper myself. And I remember when one Sunday we went to the Assembly of God Church. My father was at home. He wasn't feeling well. It was the first day I took Holy Communion. 
And that day when I came home, my father at that point then was writhing in bed with pain. Mm. And my mother brought home Penny. Penny came with us to pray over my dad. And I went into my bedroom. I fell on my knees and started crying and weeping for my dad. My dad and I were very close. And I started speaking in tongues, never did before. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, it was cool. My mother wow. already had the baptism, not me. You weren't even seeking it, were you, at that point? No, I mean, I was asking for everything that I could get from God. And I knew my mother had it and her friends had it and they talked about it. So I said, I want more, Lord. But at that point, it just came out of me. He just came out of me, words. Mm. And oh. Penny walked by my bedroom and I was so loud. She came in and said, you got the baptism. You come pray for your dad. So I went oh, in wow. at 11 years old, laid my hands on him. He was instantly healed at that moment. Glory to and God. <laughs> yes. Never had a problem with his gallbladder after that. Wow. So that's the kind of home we had, let's say, as far as seeking God. My parents' relationship, that was tenuous. But the seeking God really pressed for, I don't know, well, since my mother passed. And even my father then, too, he didn't believe in the baptism before that day, but he believed in the baptism. And about mm, two months later, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. So but my mother, when she was, I guess, mm, six years old, she wanted to be a missionary. So she pressed into that and prayed and prayed. And God did end up taking her in India and Africa and Canada with the Cree Native Indians. And where else did she go? She went to Europe. And even in the United States, various places, and really ministered to people. She became an expert in deliverance, being taught by Derek Prince, and then an expert in spiritual warfare. So she was also like a lioness Mm -hmm. and, you know, didn't fear anything. So I really got a lot of boldness and a lot of love and the knowledge of Holy Spirit and Jesus from her. And then my dad had amazing compassion for people with mental illnesses. And he's the one who really introduced me to my destiny as much as my mother, I would say. My mother spiritually, yes, my dad in the natural spiritual, if I can say it that way, because at Mm -hmm. 15, he said, let's go to Norristown State Hospital, which was a state hospital for people with mental illness. And let's volunteer there. They said they needed volunteers on a sign. So we went there. I was 15. And I thought it was fascinating. I met Queen Victoria and I met, you know, oh. <laughs> I, <Okay. laughs> I met all these people and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is fascinating. I, well, of course, I didn't know much about hallucinations and delusions and schizophrenia, but I was fascinated. <laughs> so when I was a senior in high school, I was almost 50 years ago now, I was able to go to a community service program and volunteer at Norristown State Hospital three times a week in my senior year. And I fell in love with the whole population of people who were diagnosed with mental illness and mental health challenges. And it really transformed my entire life. So it was both my mom and my dad, whom I honor profusely, who helped me to become who I am today. Wow, that is so beautiful. That is so beautiful. So fast forward. Now, you've done a lot of things on the mission field, but the Lord put you into a business kind of ministry where you are not overtly ministering, but you're covertly ministering. Tell us how that started and what you're doing. Sure, I'd love to. I'm the co-founder and CEO of what our organization called Voice and Vision Incorporated. It's a public health charity. And I started it actually with a Jewish man in 1997. and because it was built on Judeo-Christian values, that is permeated through everything we do. It's there. You can see it. We don't, however, claim ourselves as faith-based. So if you look on our website, you won't see a lot about faith per se. We have some written some articles and blogs, and we do have a prayer team, which we advertise on our website. And we do get prayer requests, actually, by email. But we started that really to get the voice of people who have mental health challenges, addictions, and disabilities, and to help create a vision in the system and services and with individuals and families that brings hope, healing, and help to those in our community and our neighbors right now in the southeastern area of Pennsylvania. So that's been very fulfilling as a I would say, I call it a ministry. Other people may not see that. They would call it a career. I did get a master's degree in human services, which, by the way, was a miracle because I did not have a bachelor's or an associate's degree. 
But wow. I know, God, <laughs> but I needed a master's degree to get the job to start the nonprofit. And so the Lord knew that three or four years in advance of that. And when I was volunteering at Norristown State Hospital, someone came to me and said that Lincoln University, which is a historically black and African-American university or college, is offering a master's degree for experience. Wow. So, yeah. Hmm. So in two and a half years, I wrote down all my experience, including all the experience I had with the end time handmaidens. And <laughs> Sister Gwen had written me a letter or you and she signed it, whoever wrote that letter. And then all the other ministries that I had volunteered with and worked with and churches and all, and all the other jobs that I had done primarily at Norristown State Hospital. And they grandfathered me in with an associates and a bachelor's and I got a master's degree. Wow. And it was absolutely amazing. And because of that, then I was able to start this work and this nonprofit. And so we've been now 26 years, we're in business. And in between, I've gone on short term missions and all. But every day, I feel like what I do is a mission and a ministry. And it wasn't until I came home from one of the mission trips that I went on that I got so depressed. And I said, Lord, and this was after already being at Voice and Vision 15 years and doing so much work and doing good work and expanding so much. And you have to know Voice and Vision, we hire everybody who either has a mental health challenge, an addiction, a disability, or as a family member of someone. So we mm. were doing a lot of ministry within the staff, you know, praying for people or at least building them up, helping them. Hope deferred, that's a big deal. We help people with that. But when about 15 years in, I had gone to the mission field several times and I came home and I wept for almost six weeks, Lord, when am I going to be in the mission field? When am I going to be in the mission field? And I heard the Lord say, you are in the mission field. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's true. And yeah. then I started listening to Lance Wanow and Ed Silvosa yeah. and all Dennis Peacock, all these amazing men of God who were talking about marketplace ministry and marketplace missions. And then I realized that I am very much in the mission field every day. And I'm very much a marketplace minister and a marketplace prophetic person and a marketplace apostle and a marketplace administrator and I'm, whatever he needs me to be. I'm going to be that on any given day for him in that place. And so now when I go in the mission field and come back, it's not a push me and pull you like I'd rather be here. I'd rather be there. It's a mm -hmm. flow. And God did that. Abba Father did that for me in his great love to really show me the truth about who I am and how important the marketplace is. And, you know, someone prophesied, I'm trying to remember who it was. I don't think it was Bob Jones, but somebody prophesied that the next big outpouring was going to be in the marketplace. So I think it's going to be everywhere, actually, personally. But right. I think for those of us in the marketplace, the opportunity we have is to get the people that aren't going to walk into a church. Yes. And yes. who may not hear from other Christians at the Walmart or at the, I don't know what stores you have out there at the, what do you have the <laughs> Lion. Whatever grocery, yeah, whatever grocery, grocery store. Grocery. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so yeah. we play a very unique role in the whole scheme of the kingdom to catch not just people, but we can catch the billionaires. We can mm -hmm. catch the millionaires where they might not be so enticed by the church. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And, you know, it's interesting to me that Sometimes we who are full-time ministry in the more classical way of expressing it at this point anyway, and, you know, the kind of we're surrounding ourselves with spirit-filled believers and developing mature believers, you know, rather discipling into maturity. I'm not talking about age. I'm talking about bringing people up into a higher level in the kingdom. And, you know, we're very surrounded by kingdom where you are surrounded by the world and the people that you hire. You're not necessarily hiring believers. You're hiring people who you mentioned the qualifications that they need to have a mental health issue or be a family member of a mental health issue. So you're going to have all kinds of people around you, but you are in a place where you can be speaking to them of the things of the kingdom without them even necessarily knowing that they're getting kingdom principles brought to them. And the day will come when they'll be ready for more instruction, but you're busy plowing the ground and at the right time planting seeds and watering seeds and things like that, right? Absolutely. And about 12 years ago, I 
said to the Lord, what do we need to break through? Because we were in one county doing two or three programs. And I knew there was much more for us to do. I'm like, Lord, how do we get a breakthrough? And yes, we were praying with some of the folks in our organization. And we always have hope that our values are so good. We believe in limitless possibilities within each individual. And we just, you know, we love and we do excellent work. So that's some of our values. And we accept people for who they are when they show up. We don't say you need to be different ever. And, you know, you just live the life of Christ and it's an amazing testimony. But about 12 years ago, I said, Lord, what do we need to break through to expand it, to really help more people and to be more places? And he said, you need intercession. And mm-hmm. I said, oh, intercession. And he said, an intercessory prayer team. I'm like, that's perfect. So I started, you know, I got out my computer and I started emailing all my best intercessor friends. He said, nope, I want you to send an email out to everybody in your organization and I said, Lord, we, we don't have that many Christians here. He said, it doesn't matter. They just need to come to agreement on the mission and on the uh-huh. prayer. And I said, okay, because it says we're two or three agree touching anything. And if they come in my name, well, it was two mm-hmm. of us that were coming in his name. Well, we had people come in his name that didn't even know they were coming in his name. <laughs> I love it. That's they were born again. Yeah. We had a a Jewish person come who was not religious. And in the beginning, she started praying like, and I hope, I wish, maybe. Well, by a year in, she's like, and Lord, I'm asking. And we had people come of other faiths. We had people come with no faith. And (laughs) fast forward 12 years later, over five or 600 prayer. No, more than that sessions oh yeah whatever that is in 12 years every single week we now at that point our budget was like two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and we reached probably about 500 people now our budget's a million four hundred thousand somewhere around there and we reach tens of thousands of people through some of the things we write and wow. for veteran work and so forth and that's really strictly off the strategy of prayer And it wasn't in, well, everybody needs to be a Christian. They all need to speak in tongues and they all need this certain thing. It was the fact come into agreement around what God wants. And the people that have the heart that will come into agreement, they're welcome. And God has done amazing things. We have gotten strategies on how to get programs from other providers who what you would call the big gun providers, like we're a little water pistol and they're like a 357 Magnum. <laughs> I probably shouldn't use a gun analogy these days, but I just have to say, <laughs> uh, if you think about it, if you think of those two things, you can think of the difference. So if you look at it at that time in our sphere of influence, that's what we would have looked like. And we've been able to not steal programs, but programs that were not doing well under those bigger providers because they needed a personal attention and a different touch, we've been able to take and expand dramatically. So God had given us strategies of things that even people said, there's no way you could do that, that we've been able to do. But it's simply because of the prayer. Another testimony, yes. we were so far into debt, let's say, with our line of credit, because we kept saying yes to things and didn't get the money. So Uh if anybody knows me, yes, I mean, I'm a strategist, but I'm a person of mercy. So somebody came from the VA, Veterans Affairs, the hospital near us and said, would you help a veteran? And he really needs help. I see that you're helping people at Norristown State Hospital. And I said, well, tell me about him. And I had a veteran on staff and I said, do you have any money for this? And they said, no. And I said, okay. (laughs) So (laughs) we paid our veteran to work with their veteran. And in a matter of a year, it transformed his life. He was a person who was an old time veteran, was stuck in his room every day, didn't go out except for twice a month to McDonald's when the caseworker took him for groceries. I I know it was so sad. Within a year... He was out going to the VFW. He was playing pool. They took the train. They went to the zoo. And about a year and a half later, he flew out to his daughter's wedding in another state. And so we do those kind of things, but we lived off of a little bit of a line of credit. And so it wasn't a good thing. And so we started praying, Lord, we did all this as 
unto you. It's not right. You know, I repented for not having good money management, but having a bleeding heart, you know, (laughs) I just figured the Lord would always provide to someone on our team said, we're going to believe the God for a $50,000 check. So we said, okay. So for one year we prayed and said, Lord, we just believe in you. We thank you for a $50,000 check. Lord, we thank you for a $50,000 check. So a year went by, our line of credit's up to the max. We have a $100,000 line of credit. We're up to 99000 I mean, we have to do the work and then get reimbursed from the counties. That's why we get so high. So it would go down, but it would go right back up. Let me make it clear. We did not spend $100,000 doing other things. Some of that money is waiting to get reimbursed from the county. But we were $50,000 overspent, right? So we got a new contract with a county, one of the local counties. We got a new contract and we were building the program and we put in a budget that we thought we needed for that year because you don't know when you're actually going to hire staff. You don't know when you're going to get the rent that the office building that you need and all that kind of stuff. So you put in what you think you're going to get from day one. So at the end of that year contract, we had $50,000 that we did not spend. And we went to the county and said, can we pay off our line of credit? And they said, yes. Hallelujah. And it went down to zero. So uh, that came in the form of a way we thought maybe some philanthropists would love what we do. But no, (laughs) it came from a government contract that we still have now. And they've expanded our contract there year after year. We're getting another expansion this year. And it's just amazing that God did that. So Those stories we just have seen, I could give you multiple stories, and then transforming people's lives and strategies. That's it. Yeah, that's what we want money for. It's not to say, oh, this is how much money we have. But money translates into helping people and uh, now helping people much more wisely. Because when I became the executive director, now CEO, I didn't know a lot about how to run a business at all. I knew nothing, actually. I was a people person. I knew how to create programs and how to help people but did not know how to run a business. Now I know how to run a business, but I still ask for all the (laughs) strategies every day. (laughs) That's what I appreciate about you is how you get Holy Spirit strategies. But now tell us about the outpouring of the Father's love. Yeah, so I around that same time, and this was, well, let's say around 2000, and I went to the mission field a couple of times. In fact, I went to Tibet with you, Karen and Philip. And the end time handmaidens, and it opened my life to missions again, and it was amazing. Mm. And I started going after that. So my heart was longing to be there. So I would see myself more as a missionary than an executive director. And then by church, I was doing the youth ministry, and it was exploding. I mean, we had kids that were unchurched that would come, partly because I said, Lord, how do we get the kids? And he would say, well, go to Jimmy's football game. I'd show up one of the kids' football game, and he would invite three of the football players on his team to come. And then he'd invite his cousin. And so, again, strategies. How do you get this thing to grow? Because, you know, they have models for that and all, but whatever. So the Lord said that. So, I mean, the youth group was going strong. And then the Lord made me lay that down, and I was brokenhearted. And then, you know, I was like working with the women at that church. And then I was on the prayer team. And The church stopped me from praying for people then. And it's just everything. Uh, My mother died. I just had this series of extreme losses. My marriage fell apart and I had to move out from serious issues that were happening in the home and take my youngest children with me. And so my mother passed. I got complaints against me at work and so much happened And I was totally stripped of every title for the most part I felt and every ministry and everything that I was doing. And, you know, the teaching that then was you have to know who you are in the Lord. And I was crying. I'm like, Lord, who am I now? Who am I now? Who am I? And I kept asking that for like six weeks and I heard nothing. And I said, Mm -hmm. okay, Lord, I don't know who I am, but who the heck are you? I don't even think I know you. And I don't think I like you. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah, I said that to God. I said, God, because I knew Jesus already. I I loved him and he loved me. You know, he was now my husband in many ways because I was (laughs) separated. But God, I thought, who are you? And I wondered, and it's, I can't ever compare myself to Jesus on the cross, but he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was a cry from his heart where he felt alone and he felt left in some regard. 
And so I wouldn't even compare. I'm not saying that. But when I felt forsaken and everything that I knew who I was and everything that I knew who God was, I didn't understand where he was and who he was and how I related to that and how I related to him and then how I related to everybody else. So then I said, okay, God, who are you? And then he began to show me as Abba Father. Mm. And, you know, I realized I never really had a relationship till that moment with a loving God, only a God who could give me, who could take away, who could interact on his terms only, not on anything that I needed or wanted, but only when he wanted to, if he wanted to. And I realized at this point now, God is a loving father. Mm -hmm. And then he showed Mm -hmm. me, he said, what did I say about Jesus? And he took me to the scripture. When Jesus went under the water and came up, he said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And I went, my goodness. And he said, I didn't call him prophet, savior, healer, deliverer. Mm. All these things that I could have called him. I called him son. That's Mm -hmm. who you are. My beloved Mm. son in whom I am well pleased. And at that moment, I embraced that scripture that says all creation is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God. Sons of God. Uh Because, you know, the son of God, Jesus, encompassed everything of the kingdom. And if he was to go and eat with a tax collector, (laughs) Mm -hmm. or he was to go and feed 5,000, or he was to go and cleanse a leper, he did whatever he saw the father do and said whatever he saw the father say. And the Lord drew me into his bosom and said, this is who you are. I want to send you and anoint you and you to receive it and understand that every day you will go wherever I want you to go, do whatever I want you to do and say whatever I want you to say. So whether it's next door with chicken soup for a sick neighbor or across the other side of the world and pray over a leader in Kenya who is having a hard time in his community to establish the kingdom there, you're going to do that. And Mm -hmm. I'm going to empower you through my spirit, my son, to do this. And they're going to work with you like that scripture in the Bible that Jesus ascended, but he worked with the disciples to do the work, right? Yes. And I'll tell you what, right then I could lay down every title Everything that people called me, oh, Valerie's a prophet. Oh, Valerie's a minister. Oh, Valerie's. I could lay everything down and I could just say, Lord, I'm a son. If people are more comfortable because I'm a woman saying a daughter, that's okay with me. Men are the bride of Christ. Women are sons of God. That's right. You know, you lay it all out there and you do whatever God said. (laughs) But I have to tell you, it took me at least three years to build that trust. And soon after the Lord started showing me how much he loved me as a father, and how precious I was as a son or a child of his, how precious. So as the Lord was showing me who he was, then I began to get curious about who I am now, right? So now I'm the son, but do I have to do anything? Because I'm a doer, right? You know that right. about me. I'm a doer. Yeah. So that means if I'm a son, I must do something, right? And I forgot a little bit about wait to get the orders, you know, like do what I see you do. <laughs> say what I hear you say. And I ran ahead of myself a little and I was in a meeting and a prophet gave me a word. You've been asking the Lord who you are. They may have said what you should be doing. And he said, it's a surprise. And at that point, I'm still learning to trust Abba. And I said, oh no, it is a good surprise, isn't it, Lord? And that was probably a year after I started getting, understanding the love. Three years went by and I really began to trust and to love and understand and listen and do what he said and saw great fruit come from it. Do what he did. I saw him do and say what I heard him say. And I saw great fruit from it. Someone else gave me a word that said, the Lord has a surprise for you. And I said, I can't wait. It's going to be a good one. So Mm -hmm. it took me a good three years, I think, to really begin to accept, to heal to embrace and to understand. And I'm still, how can we comprehend the love of God, of Abba Father, of Jesus and Holy Spirit? I mean, I'm still, like I have a saying and I say, God, when you get good, you get gooder. How much gooder can you get? Because (laughs) I just don't know how else to say it because better, yes, better, but it seems like, because it says he's good, but then he gets gooder. And then 
it's even better and better and even more excellent and more extravagant. And times sometimes mm-hmm. are really bad. Don't get me wrong. When those three years ended, I've not gotten to a point where I said, God, you're not good all the time. And so he worked in me when I was stripped of everything, then began to understand and got an outpouring of his love in my heart. And not just his love and my heart, but an embrace in my soul, like a hug. And at one point, like if you put your hands together and you put them tight together and just uh, your palms and everything, it's all tight together and you open it only a tiny bit and you look in there, it's dark as can be. And he said, Valerie, that's where you are in the darkest time. You know, people might think that's where the enemy is. He says, no, you're in the palms of my hand. Like when you put the hands together. And I'll tell you what, after that, you know, testing him out to see, do you really love me? However I did it. And he just kept showing me his goodness. There's no doubt in my mind, no doubt in my soul or in my spirit, how good he is and how wonderful and how loving and how kind. And I have to say of all the ministries that God uses me for at this point in my life, and it could be prophetic, it could be deliverance, it could be inner healing. But the most that I've seen recently is helping people with Abba's love and the woundedness of loved wounds in their hearts from a mother Mm -hmm. or father. Yeah. 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 It's huge. It's huge. The wounds, especially that come as children, you know, because, you know, some of the wounds that we get in our lives are a result of our own stupidity and our own mistakes that we make. And some of the wounds are wounds of other people hurting us that we have given a certain amount of trust. And so they can hurt us more because we trust them. But then there's the wounds of childhood where there's absolutely nothing that the child has done to Mm -hmm. cause that. And so those wounds are so devastating. Yeah. You know, when the Toronto move was going on, because you got really touched there. I did. And healing. And it was, they call it the Father's Heart. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of known as the Toronto Blessing. Yeah. But that wasn't when, you know, listening to a leadership uh, interview, it was the Father's Heart. Yeah. And we saw that. And what did a lot of people do? Kind of like with uh, the Rodney Howard Brown started with him was the laughing. Yeah. Just the laugh. The joy. All the joy because of everything they'd been through. It's like God took all the pain out yeah. and just replaced it with joy. And so nothing they could do but just fall on the floor, (laughs) you know, a lot of them. And, you know, it's just the most amazing thing. Yeah, God does. Wow. Our Father does these marvelous things. You know, when Moses said to the Lord, show me your glory. And he took him up on the mountain and he hid him in the cleft of the rock and he roared his name twice. The first thing that he said about himself is that he's compassionate. Mm -hmm. And that word in the Hebrew comes from the same root word as the word for womb. In other words, the uterus of a mother, that there's something about a woman's compassion, a mother's compassion that supersedes anything else. Because I just saw something in an article where it talked about how, and I'll put that into the show notes, this article about how it's been found that the DNA of the mother, some of it ends up in the child other than just the chromosomes. You know how you get half your chromosomes from your mother and half from your father. No, actually a piece of the mother's DNA is found in the child and vice versa. That a part of the child's DNA ends up staying in the mother. Wow. So there's something that happens even in the physical Mm -hmm. that causes a belonging that we have with each other that should be healthy. And sometimes it's not. But what I'm saying is that our heavenly father, first thing he says about himself has to do with motherly love. It's beautiful. So, you know, the healing that we need from childhood wounds comes from our father giving his motherly love. When he breathed into Adam, you know, he formed Adam out of the dust of the ground and he breathed into him Before he separated whatever it was he separated, whether it was a rib or something else, doesn't really matter. It says rib. He had put into Adam of his likeness. And he introduces himself to Moses as 
a compassionate mother first. Wow. First. So I think that when he created Adam, he had a likeness of himself that had both male and female, and he separated the female out of the male. So all I'm saying is our father has both mother and father compassion that we all need and it's healing. And so you've seen, you've seen people healed over and over and over again. Can you tell us a story or two? Yes, I can actually. And the trauma, I wanted to mention something about trauma and this will be some of the testimonies and I'm going to give you some of the most recent ones because I was in the Middle East recently And then I was in Germany last year, and I've been around people that minister in deliverance. They holler at the demons, and they're strong, and they go after the demons. And I I minister in deliverance, too. That's not the point. But someone who's had a lot of trauma, sometimes that's very scary. And you have demons, and if they're not really rooted, and they don't understand the Lord yet, and they're not strong in the spirit and all, that's very difficult. But the love of the Father heals And sometimes it's the healing touch or the healing, just the healing presence around someone and telling them you love them. But we ministered to one young woman and she had had deliverance the year before. She had been diagnosed with schizophrenia, post-traumatic stress disorder, all these different diagnoses. And she came to the ministry that we were doing. We were doing a conference on intercession and I was teaching on how to intercede for people with mental health challenges and how to minister to people. And she came And then she drove out of that before we had a chance to pray with her. And they said, because tomorrow we're going to pray with people. And it was very interesting. She drove three hours away. And then she said, no, I want to go and get prayer. She drove three hours back. And (laughs) someone that I was with thought we should just go in for deliverance. And I heard the Lord say, no, I want you to just minister my love. And I said, okay, Father, what does that look like? And so I stood in. For her mother, I said, I'm your mother now. You know, I'm I'm just explaining to her. You know, it's you think you would do that with someone with schizophrenia who has hallucinations, delusions anyway. But I did what the Lord said. I did what the Lord said for her. And I just said, I love you. And she could not even look at me in my eyes. And I just said, I want you to know I love you. And I want you. And I desire you. And you are so worthy to be born. I'm so glad you were born. I'm so glad. She said, I can't receive love. I can't, I can't receive love. She said, I even, when I became a prostitute, she had been on drugs. She was a prostitute. She said, I would go home to my mother's home and tell her I'm prostituting just for her to say, would you stop it? Just so I could see that she loved me. And she never told me even to stop that. She said, I just can't receive love. I don't know how. I said, honey, I love you. And I repent for it. Everything, as your mother, I repent for everything your mother said and did and everything she didn't do that would have blessed you and that would have honored you and would have let you know that you're wanted and desired. And I just said, the Lord had me say these amazing things over her of who she was. I didn't know her. He spoke about her gifts. He spoke about her callings. He spoke about her talents, her beauty, her attributes. I mean, he spoke all as a father would that really loved their child and knew them. As a mother would who could nurture. It was this nurturing, beautiful time. I mean, I was overwhelmed (laughs) feeling the love of the father ministering to this young woman. And I would make her look in my eyes and she'd look away. And then I'd say, look at me. And I'd make her look in my eyes until she would not take her eyes off me. And all of a sudden, you just saw everything melt away. And she started crying. And she started just her whole demeanor, her whole look, everything changed. And then she was able to tell me at the end, she forgave her mother. And she was able to say, I love you. And so it was another day that we were there. And one of the last services, we ended up praying for someone who had bad knees. And so this woman who we prayed for sat in a chair. She was the first one up to go lay hands on her knees and looked at her and prayed over her knees and over her Amazing transformation. Because before that, Mm. she wasn't really talking to people. She was shying away. She was introverted, isolated. She was the first one that went over there and kneeled before her and laid hands on her and started praying for her. And at one point before that in worship, I just went over to her and I had a heart ring on my hand and I took it off and I said, this is yours now, honey. This is for you to know 
that Abba Father will always love you no matter what, and that I will love you no matter what. And I looked at her and I said, I love you. And she looked in my eyes and received it. So just that transformation in her. So there were several other people similar. It wasn't the same thing for everybody because everybody's different. But it was, again, just ministering father's love. Sometimes it's getting to a lie. Most of us believe some kind of a lie at some point, and we have to get to the truth. But in order to want to face the lie, like I'm no good, I'm worthless, I'm unworthy, I'm unloved, I have no power, whatever the lie is, you know, and everyone has their own, some of them are similar. You have to have someone in a place of love to be able to experience that and then invite Jesus in with the truth. It's so beautiful, a very beautiful part of inner healing, but really ministering that love and standing in. Then we had another man there and he could, he hadn't slept for a very long time. I didn't know this till afterwards. He hadn't slept for a very long time. He had been homeless. They had diagnosed him with schizophrenia. It seems that's sometimes that's what a lot of people get diagnosed, either that or bipolar disorder. And lots of times, of course, that's, that's an accurate diagnosis because of the symptoms, but you know, I don't look at any of that stuff, but he sat in the just sessions and just stared ahead. And he was a little bit scary, but you know, I, I wasn't scared, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Other people might've yeah. looked at him, but he was very, he was a big man. <laughs> and um, so they asked me to pray for him and, and I prayed for him. And the Lord <laughs> said, he was wounded seriously by his mother. And I said, okay, Lord. And he said, okay, so you need to stand in that place. So I did. And I just stood in the place with the great mother's love and the father's heart. Just remember that it's both. It's a duality thing because the mother and the father, that's why we have to have a mother and a father. You know, you have the father's heart, the mother's nurturing, the father's love. And he was delivered, inner healing, set free and healed. And that night he had slept the first night all the way through. And they couldn't even remember when he had done that in a long period of time. He was refreshed the next mm. day. He was so excited. He came up and gave me a kiss on the lips. I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> so I was a little bit taken back by that. But, you know, well, oh, when are you coming again? Thank you, dear sister. Thank you, dear sister. Thank you, dear sister. I'm like, oh, glory to God. But, you know, <laughs> but I'll tell you what, um, just this last week in my own church, someone had said, you know, I'm not feeling like I'm hearing from God. And I said, and I felt Father say he is hearing from me, but he doesn't really know it. And so I drilled down a little bit, asked him what God told me to ask him. I don't want to tell the whole story because it's his story. And the Lord said, minister the father's love. Of course, I'm a woman, but you know, father is, like you said, he has the heart of a mother, right? To mm -hmm. the nurturing right. of a mother, the strength of a father and the protection of a father. And so I just ministered father's love to him and said, what a wonderful son. And I encouraged him to go home and say, teach me, father, who you are. Teach me about your father attributes. And he had a backstory about a father, of course. And then he remembered, oh my gosh, I had prayed last week. And when I woke up, I got the answer. I do hear. Uh -huh. But because of that block that the enemy had, that lie that you don't know father, you don't hear the Lord, you blah, blah, blah. You know, when the father's love was open to him and he felt it, I just had my hand on his heart, spoke very tenderly. He was able to even remember an instance and was excited about going home and hearing more. So Beautiful. again, wow. this isn't hard. It's ministering the compassionate love that the Lord gave to me. When I told him, I don't think I like you, uh, then he, he didn't say, well, get away from me then. You know, he said, let me draw you to my breast and show you who I am. Let me draw you mm -hmm. in. Come sit in my hand here. You know what I mean? Like when I saw that picture, well, which could be like a womb because it was dark inside there, two hands. Mm -hmm. So that's what we can give out to build his kingdom, to compel them to come into the kingdom, go into the highways and byways compel them to come in what's going to compel them telling them that they're lousy sinners and that they're going to go to hell well that will scare some people enough to come into the kingdom it's the goodness of god that leads men to repentance that's what the bible Amen. says right so it's through that goodness and loving kindness that people get healed too best thing for trauma ever so yes i just can't say enough about the love of God. And I want to experience it more and more and get to know him more and more. And we won't know him in his fullness until we get there. I believe it. 
yet we can have encounters with him that we know beyond any shot of a doubt that God is good all the time, no matter what we face, no matter what our children face, no matter what we face it with our boss or wherever we are, that he is always, always, always good. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Well, we're looking forward to you ministering at our convention that's coming up June 11th through 14th. And I trust that God is going to use you in a powerful way at that event and that we hope that folks that are listening are going to come. You can go to our website, globaloutpouring.org, and find more information under events. And we hope you can get here. Yeah. And if you can't get here, then follow us on YouTube or Facebook on our Global Outpouring channel on YouTube or our Global Outpouring Facebook page. Those are in the show notes here as well. So, Valerie, would you just pray for our listeners? Because I feel like there are some people that are really resonating with what you're saying. Yes, I'd love to. Thank you, Abba, Father. We just thank you, Lord. Abba, we just thank you for your great love and your great loving kindness, your tender mercies, Lord. Father, in this world where so many people are wounded, Lord, so many in the church, Father, when I go in and ask, Mm -hmm. so many have depression or anxiety or experience great trauma or great fear, Lord, or sadness and grief and sorrow. And yet, Father, you're good all the time. Your loving kindness endures forever. Lord, we just pray, Father, that you would begin to touch in a deeper way each person listening, Lord. As they cry out and say, Father, show me your great love. Father, let me know more of you and experience more of you. Father, I just pray, Lord, as you did for me, that you would heal every wound, that you would touch every grief and sorrow and expose it Mm -hmm. and let it become joy and beauty instead of ashes, Lord, the oil of joy for mourning. We just thank you, Father, that for your great love, Lord, we thank you for Jesus, you who died for us and rose again and who love us and show us the Father's love. You do, Lord, because you said, I and the Father are one. And so many, Lord, I knew I knew you, Jesus, but not in your fullness because I didn't know Abba, Lord, like you knew Abba, but yet you and Holy Spirit taught me. Holy Spirit, thank you that you indwell within us and that you teach us and draw us. You're the spirit of truth, and you teach us, show us all truth about Jesus, about Abba. You give us the strategies even to know Jesus and Abba better. And we thank you for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I just bless the people, Lord God. I pray for all those that are wounded, Lord, and those that have people with mental illnesses in their family or addictions, Lord, disabilities, those that have people that are suffering, even Sometimes these depressions that all manifest in heart disease, Lord, and diabetes and other cancers and so forth, Lord, a woundedness does as well and trauma. So, Lord, we pray for healing of those deep wounds and those deep sorrows and those deep, deep sadnesses and fears. And oh, that only you can get to, Lord, that only you can get to. A good therapist can begin to touch, but Lord, you can get to the innermost parts of the being with your loving kindness. We just pray that you'd pour out right now in Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you. The world is longing for that outpouring of Father's love. And we thank you, Father, that each one of us that's listening, each one of us that's speaking, will take that love out, Lord God, and transform the places that we go to, Lord, and touch the lives of those we come in contact with. And let us hear what you tell us to say, and then we'll say it and do what you want us to do, and we'll do it. We'll be obedient. We say, yes, Lord, here am I. Send us. We will do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being with us, Valerie. That's a real blessing to have you, and we look forward to your ministry coming up soon. Thank you. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's podcast, Please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Your review helps the podcasting platform suggest this podcast to other listeners who are also looking for a great move of the Holy Spirit. Check out our website at globaloutpouring.org to find out more information, read our blogs, connect with us, and donate. You can also browse our web store for life-changing anointed books. Until next time, this is Sharon Buss. And I'm Philip Buss. 
God bless you with his overwhelming, loving presence.